The life and legacy of Isaac Parker, the hanging judge, is more complex than his namesake. The Wild West is often associated with ideas of frontier justice. That's what to say. Individuals often under the barrel of a gun, bringing about happy outcomes where there is no power or very weak power. This includes nearly every Western movie in which the lone hero must take down nefarious outlaws, since there are no official lawmen in town. You've got the idea. The reality is that the Wild West did have laws and agencies responsible for enforcing them, although sometimes, because the borders were so wide and deep, it was difficult to do justice. This is where the character of Judge Isaac Charles Parker appears. He used his headquarters at Fort Smith from 1875 to 1896 to grant federal authority to the Western District of Arkansas. The county was quite large and included, according to the Encyclopedia of Oklahoma History and Culture, 11 counties in Western Arkansas, as well as all of Indian Territory, which is essentially present-day Oklahoma. Because of Parker's determination to deliver swift, and some would say hammer esque justice to those in his court, he became known as the Hanging Judge. Let's see why. Isaac Parker was self-taught. Isaac Parker was not a pioneer, and neither was his family. The Encyclopedia of Oklahoma History and Culture lists his birth as October 15, 1838 near Barnesville, Ohio, to farmers Joseph and Jane Shannon Parker. The Arkansas Historical Review noted that he had limited education, having attended elementary school. Parker's real ambition was the law. His obituary, transcribed by the National Park Service, states that at age 17, he began attending Barnesville Academy while teaching school. To prepare for his career as a lawyer, he bought books and studied independently. Because of his insight and intelligence, he was admitted to the Ohio Bar in 1859. This was a successful year for Parker. For that same year, he also married his wife, a woman named Mary O'Toole. The couple recently settled in St. Joseph, Missouri, where they began their practice. However, the Civil War intervened, and although Parker supported Stephen Douglas in the election of 1860, Parker remained in the Union throughout the conflict. In fact, by 1864, Parker had changed his political party from the Democratic Party to the Republican Party and was chosen as one of the state's electors for Abraham Lincoln. Parker spent most of the war as city and district attorney. After the war, at age 30, he was elected to his first position as judge of Missouri's 30th Judicial District. Parker is a development politician. Although Parker was already a judge in his 30s, his career was about to take a turn. In 1870, he was elected to Congress for Missouri for the first of two terms in the House of Representatives. An article in the Arkansas Historical Quarterly reviews these two terms, during which he notably attempted to take over Indian territories such as Oklahoma. Parker argued that the territory should be organized and provided with the law and order that a formal government could establish. The bill, which faces strong opposition from Native Americans, has been criticized by many critics who say it will show how Americans are abandoning their treaties. The bill went nowhere and Oklahoma was not incorporated until 1890. According to the Encyclopedia of Arkansas, other activities in which Parker was involved while a member of Congress included sponsoring a bill, allowing women to vote and hold office in U.S. territories, as well as supports the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Parker's political career ended in 1874, when he ran unsuccessfully for the Senate. At this time, he did not see much of a political future so he applied to the Grant administration for a judicial position. Grant proposed a meeting with him in Utah, but Parker ultimately received Fort Smith. It appears he chose Arkansas over Utah because the assignment in Utah was territorial and unsafe. The appointment to Fort Smith was a lifelong one, although Parker said much later that he initially thought the appointment to Fort Smith was temporary. Judge Parker inherited a court rife with corruption. In March 1875, Parker took office as judge of the Western District of Arkansas. He was quite young for a federal judge, only 36 years old at the time. It was also challenged in a very troubled court, according to the Arkansas Historical Quarterly. During Reconstruction, corruption and chaos were common throughout the South. This was especially true at Fort Smith, where problems were further complicated by its location on the frontier. In the years before Parker, five sheriffs were forced to resign, federal commissioners and secretaries were implicated in embezzlement, and three attorneys were fired. On top of that, Parker's predecessor, William Story, illegally manipulated court funds and accepted bribes. 
I have always conceived a single goal of justice. Equitable and exact justice is my motto, and I often tell grand juries, no innocent person will be spared. Be punished, but let no culprit escape. Judge Isaac C. Parker, 1896. Judge Isaac Parker, commonly known as the Hanging Judge of Fort Smith, Arkansas, ruled over the lawless lands of Indian Territory in the late 1800s. In 1875, Indian Territory, now Oklahoma, was inhabited by cattle and horse thieves, whiskey sellers, and robbers who sought refuge in this wild territory, free from any white man's courts. The only court with jurisdiction in Indian Territory is the United States District Court for the Western District of Arkansas, located in Fort Smith, Arkansas, on the border between Western Arkansas and Indian Territory. Isaac Parker was born in a log cabin outside of Barnesville, Belmont County, Ohio, on October 15, 1838. The youngest son of Joseph and Jane Parker, Isaac helped with farm work, but never really took an interest in the fields. Interested in working outside, he attended Breeze Hill Elementary School and then Barnesville Classical Academy. To have money to pay for higher education, he taught students at a rural elementary school. At the age of 17, he decided to study law, his legal training combining vocational training and self-study. Studying law with a lawyer in Barnesville, he passed the Ohio Bar Exam in 1859 at the age of 21. During this time, he met and married Mary O'Toole, and the couple had two sons, Charles and James. Over the years, Parker has built a reputation as an honest attorney and community leader. After passing the bar, he headed west to St. Joseph, Missouri, a bustling port town on the Missouri River. He went to work for his uncle, D.A. Shannon, a partner at the law firm Shannon and Branch. By 1861, he was working in the city and county criminal courts, and in April his political ambitions led to his election as city attorney. He was re-elected to this position for the next two years. In 1864, Isaac Parker ran for district attorney for Missouri's 9th Judicial District. That fall, he was a member of the Electoral College and voted for Abraham Lincoln. In 1868, Parker ran for and won a six-year term as judge of the 12th Court of Missouri. As a new judge, Parker would soon gain experience that he would later use as a judge in Indian Territory. On September 13, 1870, Parker was nominated for the Republican seat for the 7th Congressional District. Parker resigned as a judge to pursue his political ambitions and devoted all his energy to the election campaign. The heated campaign ended with Parker's opponent withdrawing from the race two weeks before the election, and Parker easily defeated the replacement candidate in the election of November 8, 1870. Representing the freshman class, Parker took the stand at the first session of the 42nd Congress convening on Saturday, March 4, 1871. In November 1872, he easily won a second term and gained national attention for his speeches supporting the Bureau of Indian Affairs. By the fall of 1874, the political winds had changed in Missouri, and as a Republican, Isaac Parker had no chance of being re-elected to Congress. Instead, he sought to appoint the president to public office. He has applied for nomination as a federal district court judge for the Western District of Arkansas in Fort Smith. On March 18, 1875, President Ulysses S. Grant appointed Parker as judge for the Western District of Arkansas. After the Civil War, the number of outlaws increased, destroying the relative peace of the five civilized tribes living in Indian Territory. By the time Parker arrived at Fort Smith, Indian Territory was already known as a very bad place, where outlaws believed the law did not apply to them and where terror reigned. Replacing Judge William Story, whose tenure was marred by corruption, Parker arrived in Fort Smith on May 4, 1875. At age 36, Judge Parker was the youngest federal judge in the West. Appearing for the first time in court on May 10, 1875, eight men were convicted of murder and sentenced to death. Judge Parker held court six days a week, often up to 10 hours a day, and tried 91 defendants from the bench in the first eight weeks. During that first summer, 18 people came before him for murder and 15 were convicted. Eight people were sentenced to die on the gallows on September 3, 1875. However, only six people were executed, one of whom was killed while trying to escape, and the second had his sentence commuted to general because she is young. 
he resigned because of threats of prosecution. Faced with this situation, the people of the district had great confidence in the court and systematically ignored the summons of the jury and witnesses. Parker, in these early years, did much to restore dignity and confidence at court. He arranged for federal land to be transferred to Fort Smith for a school, served on the school board, and coordinated the county fair and various charitable organizations. This largely demonstrates his political acumen. What really helped the people regain faith in government, however, was Judge Parker's commitment to justice and speedy order. Isaac Parker earned a reputation as a hanging judge early in his tenure. It didn't take long for Judge Parker to earn the nickname The Hanging Judge. The Arkansas History Magazine explains that their first case was that of Daniel Evans, accused of killing his 19-year-old friend over his boots. The evidence was clearly overwhelming, and when sentencing Evans to death, Parker was overcome with emotion and cried. But Parker cannot hope to be an effective judge if he cries at every sentence, especially considering the lawlessness that reigns in the county. He quickly got used to the harsh words. During the first months, five other men were sentenced to death. This included horse thief James Moore, who killed a deputy in a shootout, drunken murderer John Whittington, Sam Fui, who robbed and murdered a schoolteacher, smoker man-killer, a Native American killed a white man, and Edmund Campbell, an African. Americans murdered their neighbors. Parker ordered Evans and five others hanged on September 3, 1875, just four months after taking office. This public execution attracted people from all over the area and went smoothly, with a doctor declaring each man dead by falling from the gallows. This terrible event was followed by another execution of five condemned men on April 21, 1876. Over the years, Judge Parker ordered further mass executions, which were generally welcomed. Welcomed by a public order, Parker believes in equal and exact justice. If Isaac Parker were the hanging judge, one might assume he was fiery, vindictive, or at least erratic. But that is not the case. One historian even went so far as to say that he was perhaps a bit boring. He is also considered a friendly and humorous person in his private life. However, Parker in court was just doing business and carefully instructing the juries they were responsible for. In his view, Parker had the sacrosanct duty to administer justice and to do it speedily. This means that the guilty must be punished for the sake of the innocent. For Parker, this is about stopping crime, avoiding mob rule, and restoring faith in government. It should be noted that most of Parker's cases were not death sentences. Instead, they were primarily concerned with enforcing postal, tax, and liquor laws. But it was his capital trials that attracted public attention. Parker's cases ended in a guilty verdict more than 70% of the time. Parker spent 21 years as a federal judge and accumulated some impressive statistics during that time. A Social History of Crime and Punishment in America states that he tried 13,490 cases that year. T.O. achieved this amazing figure. Parker would often hold court six days a week, up to 10 hours a day. 9,454 of these cases ended with convictions. Of these, he sentenced 156 men and four women to death, and of this number 79, some sources say 88 eventually met their end on the gallows. Many of these were hanged by the executioner, George Maladin, who was known as the Prince of Hangmen. Parker never claimed personal responsibility for these executions. He once said, I have never hanged a man. The law has done that. This is true. Parker and the jury had no choice. Congress had mandated the death penalty for first-degree murder. Parker judged a rough crowd. It was common knowledge that Parker's judicial district was one of, if not the roughest in the country. Parker usually saw villainous characters pass through his court. One story is that in 1883, Matt Music, accused of raping a seven-year-old girl, stood trial in Parker's court. At one point, he saw an opportunity to escape and ran towards an exit. Then the account reads, he has removed the guards, but not Judge Parker. His honor approached, seized the fleeing prisoner, and sent him hurtling to the ground. Perhaps the most notorious criminal was Crawford Goldsby also known as Cherokee Bill, who killed at least seven people. He was hanged in 1896 after an attempted jailbreak for killing a guard. In 1895, the Rufus Buck Gang was a truly terrifying outlaw group that plundered, murdered, 
and pillaged across Indian territory. They were all hanged under Parker's supervision. Parker was sympathetic to Native Americans. One surprising fact about Judge Parker was that he showed sympathy for Native Americans in his court. This was particularly influential as he had jurisdiction over Indian territory. According to the Arkansas Historical Quarterly, due to federal treaties with various Native American tribes, Parker only had authority to hear cases between different tribes or involving non-Native Americans. This meant Parker learned a lot about the differences between the tribes and their individual laws. It also changed his previous feelings about them that he had displayed while in Congress. Many of the cases in which Parker defended Native Americans involved white encroachment on Indian territory, which had become a local problem, or the sale of liquor there. Some have theorized that this sympathy stemmed from Parker's assumption that Native Americans did not understand white law. Whatever the reason, Parker was an ally who helped protect their lands and in some cases pressured the federal government, including the president, to commute the sentences. The Supreme Court clashed with Justice Parker. Parker's relationship with the federal government developed during his career in Fort Smith. According to the Society's History of Crime and Punishment in America, Parker's first 14 years in office were the last of any sentence he imposed, including death penalty cases. This would change in 1889, when Congress passed legislation expanding the Supreme Court's jurisdiction to review and even reverse death penalty cases. This resulted in about two-thirds of the cases being sent back for retrial in the latter part of his term. Judge Parker conducted the largest funeral in Fort Smith at that time. After the hanging of Cherokee Bill in March 1896, Judge Parker was sentenced to one more death. The Arkansas Historical Quarterly states that James Cashrago was convicted of killing his boss while engaged in horse trading. He was hanged on July 1, 1896. But for all the hang-ups, Parker was essentially nuanced and saw humanity even in those he despised. At the commencement of the August term, 1896, Judge Parker was at home too ill to conduct court. Twenty years of overwork had contributed to various ailments, including Bright's disease. When the jurisdiction of the Indian Territory Land Court ended on September 1, 1896, the judge had to interview reporters at his bedside. Two months after the change of jurisdiction took effect, the judge died on November 17, 1896.